podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people. That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. <laughs> As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to welcome smartpeoplepodcast.com. To smartpeoplepodcast.com. Hello and welcome to Smart People Podcast, conversations that satisfy your curious mind. I'm John Rojas. I'm excited to be talking to you all again. We kind of went to the bullpen here because Chris evidently is, you know, getting up there where uh, he he unfortunately threw his back out, uh, has a herniated disc, and is uh, just laying down in bed trying to get some rest. So I told him, you know, take it easy. I'll do the intro. We'll keep brief. We'll get right into the conversation. We have a fantastic interview this episode with Dr. Vivian Lee, where Chris and Dr. Lee discuss the American healthcare crisis and her book, The Long Fix. So without further ado, please enjoy this interview with Dr. Vivian Lee. There's so much to talk about. Uh, your work at Barely Life Sciences, uh, your new book, The Long Fix, we're talking about solving healthcare. And what's interesting about a book like this is when you wrote it, coronavirus wasn't even a thing, I'm assuming. When you first started this, it was long before. Uh, am I correct in that assumption? Sure, years ago. How has your thinking changed, if at all, in just the past you know, four months at this point? Well, the coronavirus uh, pandemic has just been a stress test for our healthcare system. And it's just showing all of the flaws and limitations that many of us have already been aware of for many years. But it's just, you know, as a stress test, I think we're really failing that. And it's just made it even more imperative that we understand why our healthcare system is broken and really get to work on fixing it. Absolutely. And who better to kind of help us about this? I was kind of reading through your your CV and when it comes to people's backgrounds. I'm just so addicted to knowing all of their qualifications. So I just have to say, former chief science officer at NYU's Medical Center, former CEO of University of Utah Health, Harvard at 19, MD from Harvard, Rhodes Scholar, Oxford PhD, MBA from NYU, valedictorian. I mean, this is, come on, like, really? Come on. How does this happen? <laughs> I thought those were the credentials I had to get to get on to smart people. I mean, no? partly, don't get me wrong, partly, but this is a whole nother level. I'm just very curious about, realistically, there's there's a motivator there. There's something that motivates you at such a young age to excel at one of the most incredible things I've ever seen. What was it? Well, that's, first of all, that's really a flattering um, way to ask that question. And I would say that I've always been uh, just really curious about things. I think that's part of the reason why I have become so interested in healthcare. It's because I feel like it's one of the most complicated things and most difficult problems and complicated issues to understand. And so I really, really just sort of has really piqued my curiosity. Um, when I was younger, I was uh, originally very interested in engineering. And actually, one of the degrees that I uh, received when I was in Oxford was as an engineer. And, and engineers are all about solving problems. Um, healthcare, on the other hand, is all about really working with people. And people are not like engineering problems. They're actually much more complicated, much more interesting. And I think where I've ended up in my career is at the intersection of the two, being able to work with people and trying to help them as much as possible, but also thinking about the the systems that are in place that keep us from really doing that. As you mentioned that, I've had this reoccurring thought for about six to 12 months as I think through purpose. You know, I'm very purpose driven. What do I want to accomplish while I'm here? It's something I always go down that road. And one of the biggest things that I've come to is all of these things we say we're making progress on, right? Technology, 5G, 
these new phones, touch screens, all this really, in my opinion, they don't matter. And the reason I say that is because imagine life before the iPhone, life was fine. You know, it's like now that we know that we have this technology, we feel like we can't live without it, but it's one of those things without it, everything was fine. And the reason I bring this up is because when I keep going back to then what are the things that really matter? It always has to deal with physical health, mental health, happiness, emotions. I don't know. So it almost seems like the most important thing we possibly could work on. Health is definitely the most important thing to us. And we really see it now in these times of the COVID pandemic. And yet at the same time, it's that one intractable problem. I know when we were first going around and talking about this book that uh, I was going to write, the number of people who would roll their eyes when they'd hear the word healthcare. And then I'd think to myself, but this is the most important thing to you, your, the, your health, the health of your parents and the health of your kids. And yet election after election, we just feel like this is a problem that our country cannot get on top of and we can't solve. And so at the end of the day, it is the most important thing to us. And it's also something that we all have to recognize is not easy to fix. But if we don't step up to it, we're, we're just, you know, we're, we're setting up our country to, to, you know, fail in future preparation too. So we, we just have to really get on top of it. Now, when you say technologies don't matter, I do want to say that I think technology does have a huge role to play as part of helping to fix our healthcare system and helping mm -hmm. to make people be healthier. Maybe it's not necessarily, um, uh, maybe it's not necessarily, it, it's not the only thing that's important, uh, but I think it is something that's going to uh, accelerate um, the, the way in which we can care for people. And we're seeing it now with telehealth, for example, how can we use technology to keep people connected to the healthcare systems? It's such a good distinction because I, I definitely didn't articulate that well enough because what, one of the things I've thought about is, for example, how many of our brightest minds are working at startups whose job is to create the next killer app or invest in the next XYZ company? I know when I graduated college, the big thing was going into finance. And there was this whole issue with, because that's what I did and it was awful. Um, there was this whole issue with a lot of the smartest people, myself not included, um, were going into finance rather than the places we need a, needed them. Things like science and healthcare. And so it's part of, and it's part of the reason why your book is called The Long Fix. I mean, it's all this long detailed process. But what I'm wondering is how does the US actually compare to the rest of the world? because we are constantly trying to sift through different messages on where we actually stand as it relates to our healthcare system and its effectiveness. The U.S. has uh, by far the greatest healthcare bill in the world. We spend two to three times as much on healthcare per person than most of our peers in Europe, Canada, Australia, New Mexico, and at the same time, our health outcomes on average are significantly worse. We don't live as long. We have higher infant mortality. Our, ba our babies are more likely to die. Uh, we have a higher rate of obesity and chronic diseases than most countries on average. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't have access to some of the best health care in the world. It's just it's not evenly distributed across the country. And so as a result, we have overall much lower health statistics than most other developed countries. And that in part is because we have so many people who have no access to health care or very little access. So about 8 to 10 percent of the American population is still uninsured. And that means that they don't have access to the kind of obvious preventive medicine solutions that they should have access to. For example, instead of taking a 10 cent blood pressure pill every day, they end up having hypertension and develop strokes and heart attacks and show up in emergency rooms and in our hospitals and are 
uh, you know, suffer as a consequence of that. And so as a result, we see that compared to the rest of the world, we are not performing as well as we could, even though we have some of the best scientists, some of the best people making very important discoveries, finding new drugs than anywhere else in the world. It is really a paradox. From my perspective, I do believe that our healthcare system is broken. And clearly, it's one of the most talked about issues at the moment. But what it sounds like you're saying is the reason we rank so low in a lot of these categories isn't because we don't have the resources or the skills. It's just that they are not distributed to everyone. So is it fair to say if we had the exact same system we had now, call it same resources, same doctors, same technology, but everybody in our country was had access to it, we would then be in the top. And, and when I say in the top, it's not for a competition's sake. It's just to give us a comparison. So is that fair to say it's mostly an issue of access and not an issue of capabilities? Actually, it's an issue of, uh, it's a really, that's a, such a great question that you're asking. Because one of the pieces of it is access. And the reason why people don't have access is because we're spending so much on everyone else. So if you look at, as I said in the or earlier, we are spending two to three times as much on healthcare than any of these other countries. And the reason for that is because we're really wasting a lot of money in our healthcare system. And why are we wasting money in our healthcare system? Because we are set up to incentivize our doctors and our hospitals and our pharmaceutical companies to spend more, to overdiagnose, to overtreat, to do things to people rather than incentivizing them to achieve better health. So some of the statistics really I found shocking in the course of doing the research. We are wasting 30% of every dollar we spend on healthcare. And right now in this country, we spend about three and a half trillion dollars on healthcare. So we're wasting more than a trillion dollars. Wait, is that 3.5 trillion a year? A year on healthcare. What? And we're wasting more than $1 trillion of that every year. Now, when, when you say waste, how do, we, how do we define waste in this equation? Well, if you think about the way in which we practice medicine now, and I think many people may not understand this because we don't talk about it that much. Our healthcare system is designed to incentivize doctors and hospitals and just everyone in the healthcare business to do more to people. We call it in the business a fee for service model. I call it paying for action. We pay for doctors to do operations, to refer you to specialists, to do lab testing, to prescribe medications. We pay for action. We don't pay for results. So we pay for operations, even if you don't necessarily need them. So one of my biggest pet peeves is low back pain, for example. So mm -hmm. many Americans, so many, I don't know if you've had an episode of low back pain, Chris. I oh yeah, not. let's talk about it. But okay, wait, I'll let yeah. you go first. <laughs> right? Okay. So you have pain, you go see a, a doctor and in the way our healthcare system is structured now, that doctor is most incentivized. And I'm not saying that they all will do this, but they're most incentivized. The way in which the system makes the most money is if you go and have an MRI scan, I'm a radiologist, so I would say thank you very much because that's more business for me, and then to send you to the operating room for a surgeon to operate on your back. That's how the healthcare system makes money. Evidence shows now through research study after research study that most people with back pain, especially if you don't have any neurologic symptoms, so um, no weakness in the legs, you know, nothing that shows that the back pain is actually affecting your nerves. If you have what they call uncomplicated back pain, you really need to just have rest, maybe some physical therapy. And for most people, that back pain gets better within a month or two. Hmm. In this country, we overoperate because that's how our healthcare system is set up. And if you were trying to run this business, what would you do? You'd buy more MRI machines 
and you build more operating rooms because that is how you make a profit. You don't really make money on prevention, on giving people advice about how they should stop smoking and lose weight. That, that doesn't make your system money. You make money through your operating rooms, through imaging, through high-priced drugs and pharmaceuticals. And so as a result, we do things to people. We tend to overdiagnose. We tend to overtreat because that's how our system is structured. That's how we're incentivized. And so the waste can get buried in a lot of that. A lot of the waste is in overdiagnosis and overtreatment. Another huge area of the waste is, is actually the kind of waste that, that uh, causes tremendous misery to everyone involved. And that is the battle between insurance companies and healthcare providers like doctors and nurses and hospitals and rehabilitation centers. The battle between insurance companies and providers for our healthcare dollars. Mm. And we sometimes get caught in between as patients. And that's what we talked about in terms of surprise billing that you read about and hopefully have not experienced personally. But surprise billing is when patients get stuck in between. But that battle between the two means that we spend about 8% of our healthcare dollar just on administrative paperwork. Right. Just Doctors sending bills to insurance companies, insurance companies denying them, sending the paperwork back, back and forth, back and forth. That's causing 8% of our healthcare dollar. Let's take a quick break for this week's sponsor. This week's episode is brought to you by Mint Mobile. I got my first cell phone with one of the big wireless providers mm, 20, 25 years ago. And I've honestly hated my monthly bill ever since. But then I discovered there's another option that could give me the premium service I'm used to at a fraction of the cost. I could cut my wireless bill down to just 15 bucks a month and save hundreds of dollars by switching to Mint Mobile. For anyone out there who's looking to save without sacrificing service, switching to Mint Mobile is a no-brainer. For customers that hate their wireless bill, Mint Mobile offers premium wireless for just 15 bucks a month. By going online only and eliminating the traditional cost of retail, Mint Mobile can pass significant savings on to you. Every plan comes with unlimited nationwide talk and text plus crazy fast 4G LTE. You can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone number along with all your existing contacts. And if you're not 100% satisfied, Mint Mobile has you covered with their 7-day money-back guarantee. Switch to Mint Mobile today and get premium wireless for just 15 bucks a month to get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free. Go to mintmobile.com slash smart. That's mintmobile.com slash smart. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash smart. And now back to the episode. And that's, I cannot wait to get into the fix with you. How do we actually fix it? Um, and I actually don't know a lot about your stance on this, but what's interesting, I, I was watching the democratic debates not too long ago, obviously healthcare is at the forefront and they talk about how are we going to pay for this? And I'll never forget. One of the things Bernie said was, you know, look, we're spending X amount. I guess it equates to that 8% just on this administrative work that would no longer be there. So right off the top, we're going to save, you know, eight, 10%. And I remember thinking like, that is not talked about enough for all the things we government can be wasteful. I mean, I'm a, I'm a huge <laughs> believer in that as well, but I think there are some inefficiencies that could be controlled due to this. And again, I, I we are absolutely going to get into your fix for this, but I want to keep going into the problem a little bit on a global level. Are we the only ones who have this issue of the model where the healthcare workers are incentivized to bill more? We're probably, we're not necessarily the only system in the world that has a, some element of this. Um, certainly most of the third world and developing countries, uh, many of them operate on a fee for service basis where you go to your local community physician and then you pay them out of pocket for care. Oh, right. Uh, but when we compare ourselves to say the OECD nations, the um, more, I think, what we would call our peer nations, then we are we are pretty unusual, especially in the fact that all of our healthcare is structured in this way. 
And when you say that, especially in that fact that all is structured, what do you mean? What's the differentiation between some healthcare and others? So, for example, if you look at the Swiss healthcare system, which is a mix of both a government, a public, and a private healthcare system, the insurance companies there do are privately run and do compete for um, the business of the public, but they are required to provide a common standard, like just a basic level of insurance. Maybe it's like Medicaid let's say, and it has to be a fixed dollar amount so that everyone pays the same amount and gets the same benefits. Mm. So at that level, for the basic level of care, there's really not that much competition. But there is a whole level of sort of premium care, I guess you could call it, where they can compete for everyone's business to buy up to pay supplemental insurance. And then you could be paying more for private rooms or for specialists or that level of business is just in the private sector and, and it's just open for competition. Mm. But for the core level, like basic care, uh, it's basically standard and, and applies to everybody. It's this human nature where you do what you're incentivized to do. You do what your boss or your company or your employer asks you to do. And it's not as much results oriented, just like you said. You're, you're absolutely right. In fact, we noticed as radiologists, when, when I was in medical school, um, we all, one of the parts, one of the roots of rites of passage is to learn the neurologic exam, to everything from reflexes to asking people to follow your finger, you know, all those kinds of things that you probably experienced mm -hmm. at some point. And then we discovered the brain scan and the brain MRI or the brain CAT scan and now I'd say there's, there's a few generations of folks who really have come to completely rely on the imaging studies because that's just how the system has been incentivized and also because everybody is really busy and also, have to mention, worried about medical legal consequences as well, so always better yeah. to err on the side of caution. And so as a result, our system has just evolved away from uh, a lot of the more traditional ways that we many of us grew up practicing medicine and, and it's yeah. kind of a shame. And, and what you're saying really, Chris also um, leads me to, to emphasize that it's really the system that is incentivizing this. As you've also said, most of the people within healthcare really wish that our system was different. In fact, about half of physicians are actually burned out Mm -hmm. And that is actually a diagnosis. And that was before COVID. I, I can't even imagine what's going to, what the numbers are going to look like after COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, because the, you know, from a physician perspective, what's happening is the health system is incentivizing their bosses and the hospitals that they work for and the clinics that they work for to get them to do more and more and more. And they're also at the same time, the same individuals who have to deal with the paperwork and fight the insurance companies as they often think about it as being. And the administrative burden, couple of hours in the morning, couple of more hours at night, what they call pajama time, just with the electronic medical records. And so as a result, we also have a whole workforce that is dying for a better healthcare system. Um, so it's, it's, I think it's a really important time for, for change to start happening. I talk about this a lot with my wife. She's a teacher and there's a little bit of an analogy there where teachers have been almost, in my opinion, boxed in, they're scrutinized, they're, their kids are tested. My wife is a kindergarten teacher and she has to test kids, I want to say four times a year. I mean, they're, they're five years old, you know, and it's, it's testing, it's standardized testing, and it's all to get to the standardization. And the problem is every teacher I know, everyone my wife works with, they are far more interested in the kids' outcomes and the kids' well-being than anyone could ever test them to, than any system could make them be. If anything, what I believe is the system makes them less effective. People get into these industries because they want to help people. And what oftentimes I think is we are constraining them by making them follow a set of rules. Do you see a lot of similarities in healthcare? Oh, I so agree with what you just said. Mm. Uh, in fact, I think one of the core problems is 
that uh, or one of the core opportunities is that if if we could just enable the people who have come into this profession, just like the folks who become teachers, to uh, to put forward their ideas and to let them express their own desires. Have, have you read that book, Drive? Oh yeah, by Daniel Pink. Dan, Dan, Dan. Oh, I think that really applies to the population of physicians. Like, there's a, a guy that I interviewed for this book. His name is Rushka Fernandopoli. He's a physician in Boston, and he tells me this story about one night he's working in his practice. It's one of those miserable, really short days in Boston. Sun's already gone down, even though it's like four in the afternoon. <laughs> and uh, he and a colleague are sitting there and they're digging through all the paperwork and they know they're going to be there late at night. And they're just thinking, is this really how we should be caring for patients? We saw patients every 10 minutes, you know, and now we're kind of checking through all the records and doing all the paperwork. And he just quit and decided to set up his own practice, a new business model. It's called Iora Health. And what did they do? They said, okay, how can we figure out a way to care for our patients, especially elderly population, better, and do it in a way where we actually get paid the right way? So they worked out a contract with Medicare. Medicare pays them a fixed amount of money every year a certain amount of money per patient that they care for, and then lets them figure out how to spend that money to keep those patients healthy. Oh, and wow. partly, partly they're paid by if the patients are satisfied or not, right? So they bend over backwards to make sure that the patients are satisfied because they want them to stick with them. But what do they do? Well, instead of assigning 2,000 patients per doctor, which is a typical ratio in most primary care clinics, they assigned about 600. They hired a few health coaches to work with the sickest patients, people from their communities who spoke their languages, for example. They offered um, yoga and Zumba classes. They actually partnered with Lyft to make sure that the patients could get to their clinic appointments. Uh, they reviewed all their medications really carefully and de-prescribed. You know, a lot of times elderly patients, especially, you know, they come up with these bags of pills and they don't even know what they all are. Yeah. So they went through all their meds and made sure that they were on the right meds. And at the end of the day, they said, we spent more time with them and that cost us more in the clinic. But because we were a responsible patient as a whole, we actually found out that we could lower their hospitalizations by 30%. Wow. So just by reducing their hospitalizations, that meant they were keeping them healthier, but they also made a business model that worked because they saved enough money by keeping them out of the hospital to pay for the primary care. So it's like your wife. If you actually gave her the opportunity to define, well, how would you want to be evaluated? How would you want to make sure that your kids were learning? Just mm -hmm. throw some of the existing, you know, administrative work and bureaucracy out the window and give them a chance to define it. I think we have a lot more, we'd have a lot more innovation and a lot more satisfied people working in the field. And now a quick word from this week's sponsor. Listen, I'm going to be honest. There's a lot going on in the world right now. And some of us can probably use someone to talk to. BetterHelp Online Counseling is there for you. Connect with your professional counselor in a safe and private online environment it couldn't be easier. It's super convenient. You can get help on your own time and at your own pace. And you can schedule secure video or phone sessions plus chat and text with your therapist. If you need someone to talk to, there are licensed professional counselors who are specialized in depression, anxiety, relationships, sleeping, anger, grief, self-esteem. You name it, there's somebody there for you. And everything you share is confidential. If you're not happy with your counselor for any reason, you can request a new one at any time at no additional charge. BetterHelp has 3,000 U.S. licensed therapists across all 50 states. So get connected and talk to someone today. And best of all, for Smart People podcast listeners, it's a truly affordable option. Our listeners get 10% off your first month with the discount code SPP. So why not get started today? Go to BetterHelp.com dot com slash SPP. Simply fill out a questionnaire to help them assess your needs and get matched with a counselor you'll love. One more time, that's betterhelp 
dot com slash SPP. And now back to the episode. The, the common pushback is, and especially in America where you have this income inequality, and I think I can represent a decent perspective here because I fully recognize I am very lucky. It is not for hard work. I, I mean, we have great health care. So from my perspective, if I wanted to be selfish, I could say, look, this system works for me. I mean, we spend so much money on healthcare, but like I get to use it. I can go to these amazing doctors. We've got hospitals everywhere. Um, I can afford it and I can give myself the best chance. Now, I realize that would be a selfish perspective, but for those people that have that perspective, they fear that, you know, if we change healthcare, yeah, it might be better for the majority, but it might be worse for them as the quote unquote minority. Tell me w the reality behind that. Is that true? Would it get worse for us? Would we have these long lines that people talk about are happening in Canada? If we're wasting one third of our healthcare dollar or more than a trillion dollars on healthcare, that's everybody is impacted on that. Mm. And I think one of the things that most people don't realize in healthcare is they think, you know, I'm lucky. I'm insured. I'm not really paying for health care or I'm I'm covered by Medicare. So my insurance is sort of taken care of. The reality is that we are all paying for health care and we're not even just paying for it once or twice. We're actually paying for it at least three different ways. It's just it's just hidden or a little bit invisible to us. So so, for example, if you if you think about our generation compared to our parents' generation or even before that, our wages across the country have essentially been flat for about the last 50 years. And that's because healthcare costs have been eating away at our wages. We don't really see it, but it's happened. You also know that uh, it's not only actually eating away from our wages, it's also cutting into our retirement money. So employers used to put uh, more than half of our benefits into retirement, and now it's only about a third. So it's sort of an insidious effect. We don't necessarily, we're not aware of it every day, but it's really cutting into our wages. We're also, of course, paying for it explicitly through our Medicare taxes. We're paying for our, the health care of the future for, for those of us who are still working now. And then actually there's a third completely hidden tax, which is, because of the way we set up healthcare in this country, employers who pay for health insurance for their employees do so as a tax benefit. And so that actually reduces the overall amount of taxes that go to the government that we pay. We make up for that through our individual taxes as well. So we're paying for the high costs of healthcare right now. Uh, individually, we're paying for it, and then we're paying for it kind of at a macro level across the whole society. And it's really been impacting uh, our uh, competitiveness as a country. Um, I remember some of the initial data that I was looking at when re researching this book where, uh, you know, the folks at General Motors, for example, were lamenting the fact that they were spending more on health care for their employees than they were still in the cars. Wow. And the big three were complaining back in the days of the bailout that it was really because of health care that they were failing to compete successfully globally. And I think we're seeing that not just in the, in the auto industry, we're seeing that across the board in this country. So the question becomes, can we lower costs, increase access, keep the same or increase availability, right? So wait lines, you know, all that and lower costs and increase results. Yes. We can. Okay. We need that magic bullet. <laughs> Come on now. Give me that magic bullet. By the way, like, here's why I've been waiting. This is my crescendo. You're one of the smartest people I've ever talked to. So I have always been this believer in outsourcing my initial opinions. Of course, I'll internalize them to the people who know it best. So I'm ready. Just tell, just give us the answer. The problem with our healthcare system now, as we talked about, is that we're incentivizing everyone to deliver action, to do things to people. And so we're using one of the biggest forces that we know, which is capitalism. And we're directing it completely in the wrong direction. 
We've incentivized about one-fifth of the U.S. economy and growing to continue to grow without holding them responsible for delivering better health. So the solution, or one of the, one of the key components of the solution, one of the core problems that we have to pivot on, is we have to start expecting our healthcare system to deliver results. That we have to expect to pay for health outcomes, to pay for better health, and not simply just pay every time to have things done to us. Mm. And that plays out, and you may say, well, that, that sounds great in principle, but how does that actually work? And I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. So one example is in the way in which we think about our medications and the way in which we price our drugs. This is an area that we've been reading about a lot in the news that our, uh, our government has been thinking about and trying to work on. If we actually thought about our medications the way we thought about other goods and services that we buy, we'd actually expect to pay more for the drugs that worked better. We'd actually expect to pay less or nothing for drugs that don't work at all. And we'd expect to know which drugs work better and which drugs don't. That data, those data are actually available. We could, and, and in other countries, actually, the, the governments do use that data to decide which drugs to pay for and which ones don't. Uh, there's a, a whole um, governmental unit in the UK. There are other organizations in Canada. We even have organizations in the US that look at what they call the cost effectiveness of drugs. So how much does a drug improve life or improve health for a person compared to how much it costs? And they use that in order to decide which drugs to cover and which drugs not to cover, for example, in the UK and in Canada. We don't use those data in the US. We pay whatever the, whatever the pharmaceutical companies, however high they can price their drugs, that's what we really essentially end up paying. What are some drugs that are currently prescribed fairly often, so there's a large cost, that really don't meet that criteria? What, what drugs are we taking as Americans that don't really provide a benefit? Well, they may provide a benefit, but the benefit may not be um, worth the amount that we're paying. Sure, yes. So there are a number of different, for example, cancer drugs that may extend life by six to eight weeks, for example. And six to eight weeks can be very important to many people, can be important to all of us. But for the amount that they cost, they wouldn't be considered cost effective. You may be able yeah. to extend life six to eight weeks with a much less expensive drug, for I example. See. And yet we really don't know that. We, we, there's actually a, a really great website that I suggest that people look at sometimes, which is um, put out by the folks at Memorial Sloan Kettering in, in New York. And it actually compares maybe about 50 or 60 of the leading cancer drugs and actually shows you how much they extend life compared to how much they cost. Now, those are difficult decisions. And, and I think that... Um, they are hard for individuals to make, but for hospitals and pharmacies, if they could have access to that information, they could make much better decisions about which drugs they should be offering patients and not. And many of these drugs, of course, as you know, have important side effects. So you really want to weigh in also those side effects. Mm -hmm. So you have the benefit less the side effects against the cost of the drugs. And if we could make that information widely available to people, then all of those people who are um, responsible for deciding, for example, what drugs should be available in the pharmacy of a particular hospital or of a given health system, could actually make better decisions that could then guide the physicians and others who are prescribing those medicines. And, and like you said, that is one that's talked about often. I mean, when I hear about things like, um, you know, insulin or EpiPens, I mean, those costs, it, at some point we have to regulate, we, we have to 
have government intervention there, don't we? Uh, I think there's important government regulation right now in terms of just looking at the safety uh, of medications through the FDA process. Um, I would love to see more information about the actual cost effectiveness of drugs. Mm. Uh, there are, uh, through the Affordable Care Act, there was an entity that was set up, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, um, which is a branch of the government that uh, funds research to look at all different kinds of treatments, including medications. But right now, through um, it's actually part of the law. They're not allowed to use uh, cost-effectiveness data to evaluate different treatments. Mm. So they're only allowed to look at, does it extend life by a week, by a month, or you know, how does it actually affect a patient? But if it costs a million dollars to extend life by a couple of days, they're not allowed to look at the cost piece of it. This week's episode is brought to you by Audible. At Smart People Podcast, we absolutely love Audible. We know everybody doesn't have the free time to sit down and just read all day, but we do know that you have the ability to listen to things throughout your day because, hey, you're listening to this podcast. You could be listening to audiobooks as well. And I know plenty of you are still going strong with your New Year's resolutions, whether it's getting fit, reading more, or becoming a better parent, leader, person, whatever it may be. And Audible can absolutely help you with that. With Audible, each month, members get one credit to pick any title plus two Audible originals from a monthly selection. You can download titles and listen offline anytime, anywhere. And the app is free, and it can be installed on all your smartphones and tablets. And one of the coolest features of Audible, you can listen across devices without losing your spot. And if you can't decide what to listen to, don't worry. You can keep your credits for up to a year and then use them to binge on a whole series if you'd like. Head over to Audible and check it out. So listen up. Visit audible.com slash smart or text smart to 500-500. Yep, it's that easy. Head over to audible.com slash smart or text smart to 500-500. And now back to the episode. That's really surprising because... In so many areas, if, if people are listening saying, well, yeah, you can't put a, a price on life. I mean, it happens every day. We talked to a guest who said when the, the Ford, I think it's Ford Pinto was released, they knew that there was an error, but they calculated that the cost of life and, and those that died because of that error was less than the cost of recalling the car. So like companies do this every day, put a, put a price on life. Yeah, they do. And, but Additionally, when you start looking at things this way, you also start to realize just how valuable prevention is. Mm. So you talked about insulin. Uh, one of the areas that uh, we work on in the company that I work for, Verily, is uh, a way to enable diabetic patients to actually manage their blood sugars and to manage their diabetes uh, better just through technology like a continuous glucose monitor that they can put on their arm and actually measure their blood sugars. And then they can track their food and they can actually look at how their diet and their exercise might be affecting their blood sugar. And that has actually been shown not only in our company, but in others to significantly help improve their ability to manage their, their blood sugars and to reduce their dependency on some of the medications like insulin and some of the oral drugs. So once you start looking at the cost effectiveness, that's when you start shifting from saying, oh, I need to do more. I need to prescribe more and more expensive things to, oh, actually, the most cost effective treatment is actually prevention. It's actually better management of these chronic diseases before you need an operation and before you need um, more aggressive treatments, for example. You mentioned how these are bipartisan solutions. And I think when people hear the word healthcare, it instantly becomes a partisan issue. So I'm really interested in your stance on how can we present a solution that in today's, you know, really polarized political environment, we could actually take action on this. Healthcare is, a, it ha health has to be nonpartisan or bipartisan because health matters to, to all of us. And I'd say that the, the 
the most important thing to realize is that we have a system right now that is relying both on the government and the private sector to deliver health and to, to provide better health outcomes to its people. And we have to be able to work together so that both the government and the private sector are able to deliver on that. And one of the most important things that we have to get right is to understand that both in the private sector and in the public sector, everyone who's paying for healthcare has to be paying for better outcomes and paying for better health. It doesn't matter whether it's Medicare or commercial insurers who are being paid for by the, by the employers. If we can get that alignment, um, then I think we're just going to see much, much better health outcomes for the whole population. Most people don't realize now that Medicare is actually mostly paid on a fee-for-service basis. Medicare pays people to do more things to people, pays for action, not for results. And so we need to pivot both Medicare and the private sector to paying for better health and better outcomes if we want to start moving moving healthcare in the direction we need to. Yeah, and I feel like if we started with Medicare, that would have such a big impact on, you know, these healthcare companies that they would almost be forced to move in that direction. Exactly. So Medicare has already been making some initial steps in this direction. So they, for example, by rolling out some of the Medicare Advantage programs, like the one that I described, uh, Iora Health embracing, they've given the responsibility to spending money in healthcare more wisely. They've given that responsibility to some of these medical groups. And these medical groups are showing that by investing in spending more time with their Medicare patients who might be on multiple medications, might have multiple conditions, if we spend more time with them, if we offer prescription refills conveniently on site, if we offer transportation to the clinics for those who can't afford it, if we give them access to um, better physical fitness programs like yoga or tai chi, um, teach them some fall prevention classes, offer those, that we can actually really improve their health outcomes and reduce the cost of care and save about a third uh, of their health care bills in the following year. Those are huge savings. And by keeping every elderly patient out of the hospital, you're keeping them independent for longer um, and you're just improving their life so much more. So it becomes a win-win. And that's really what we need to start achieving. Last question is just, why do you think we're struggling with this change so much? I mean, so many people want the change. So many people see and experience the problem, especially now with coronavirus. Why are we really so slow to act, so slow to change, and so resistant to it? One of the reasons why it's the long fix is because it's a really complicated problem. And there are very many people, it's, it, healthcare is about 18% of the U.S. economy. So there are a lot of people who's, who feel, I think, as you mentioned earlier on, that they have a vested interest in the status quo, or they're worried about change. As much as there's a, many people who want to see change, there are many people whose lives are dependent on the, on the way healthcare is now. So I think at some point, it really comes down to um, leadership. I think we need to see that some changes need to take place now in terms of the health policies that are being administered. Um, we are seeing some of that leadership already, but we need it to move faster. So some of the initiatives that the folks in the Department of Health and Human Services have put forward to try to move payment models to paying for better health outcomes, they just need to move faster. We also need to see the employers band together and work more effectively because the employers pay for health care for about half of the American population. Mm -hmm. And I actually offer a number of recommendations, an action plan for how employers can take more control over the health care bills of their employees and try to improve the health as well as reduce their cost of care. Um, and we need to recognize that this is a problem that we all have a role in, 
And we have to understand what the problem is in order to support our leaders in making those changes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Lee, you know, and everyone listening, your brand new book is called The Long Fix, Solving America's Healthcare Crisis and Strategies That Work for Everyone. And there's so much we could cover. I mean, I'm like, man, I'm going to have to start moving my podcast interviews to two hours. But I know that in your crazy world, an hour is a day. So I'm so appreciative of the time you've taken. I want to recommend that everybody pick up this book because in my opinion, and as you've just heard, it is perhaps the most pressing issue of our life and everybody has a role to play. It's one of my favorite parts in your message is what can each and every one of us do? As we let you go, I just wanted to ask, is there anything else you'd like to leave with people or anywhere else you would like to direct them? Of course, we'll link to the book. Um, I was actually searching for that the website you mentioned about Sloan Kettering. Um, anything else for us that you would kind of impart upon us on where we can learn about you, find things, et cetera? Well, I, I have a, a website, uh, VivianLeeMD.com. And I think the final message that I have for you is that I, I feel very optimistic about our future, um, not only because I feel like we we are at uh, this sort of moment of crisis and everybody is really focused on how we can improve health uh, for our people for the future so this never happens again to us, but also because um, the reason one of the reasons why I wrote this book was for our first year medical students back when I was the dean at the University of Utah. And when I talk to those students who are looking forward to their careers in healthcare, the doctors, the nurses, the physical therapists, um, I could see that there was so much, they, they were coming into healthcare expecting it to change, having access to ways of thinking and tools and technologies that people in my generation really didn't have and have this determination to make things better. And so I, I feel very optimistic that if we can uh, allow some of these folks to really move forward with, with their energy and their passions, maybe provide a little bit of direction from our experiences that we're going to see a much brighter future ahead. Well, I think that message of hope and optimism is much needed and for that and for everything, your deep thinking on this, your expertise, we are all thankful. Happy to have you here still, and I hope you enjoyed that interview with Dr. Vivian Lee. Lee. Dr. Lee's book, The Long Fix, Solving America's Healthcare Crisis with Strategies That Work for Everyone, can be found wherever books are sold. Now a quick rundown of all the housekeeping items. If you'd ever like to reach out to the show, you can email Chris and I at smartpeoplepodcast at gmail.com or message us on Twitter at smartpeoplepod. And of course, if you'd like to support the show, you can always do so for free by just leaving a rating or a review wherever you download your podcasts. And if you're feeling extra generous and you want to donate monetarily, you can always head over to Patreon at patreon.com slash smartpeoplepodcast. Of course, you don't have to do any of that to help out the show. You can always just tell a friend, a family member, a loved one, whoever it may be, just tell them about the show, have them download an episode or two, and just check us out. And of course, if you want to stay up to date all things Smart People Podcast, head over to the website, smartpeoplepodcast.com, and sign up for the newsletter over there. All right, as always, during this time, I hope everybody is staying safe, staying healthy. And of course, we've got a lot of great content coming up for you. So stay tuned. Got some great interviews. And we'll see you all next episode. <music>